morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are. My name is Sonny Misser, and I serve as the Chief Executive Officer of Accountability. I would love to welcome you today to our panel discussion, where we're going to focus on the business imperative of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how does one tackle a systemic challenge through an integrated and a cohesive approach. We at Accountability are honored to be working together with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology uh, in convening this panel, in bringing together to you all these experts, renowned academics and esteemed business leaders. And the purpose of bringing this panel together is to get their views and their collective thinking of the interdependence between ideas and practice, and essentially, how do we develop principled leaders for the next generation, for the next normal? And with that in mind, it is an absolute honor for me to introduce to you the person who has probably the most challenging job, uh, Dean Melissa Nobles, who serves as the Keenan Shaheen Dean of the School of Humanities, Arts and Sciences, Social Sciences at MIT. And Melissa is going to be leading us and moderating this session. Uh, and with Melissa, we have an all-star cast. And I'll start with the MIT side first. Uh, a good friend and the Associate Dean of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at the MIT Sloan School of Management, Professor Ray Reagans, who is also the Alfred P. Sloan Professor of Strategy and Organizational Studies at the MIT Sloan School. We have Ms. Sanda Ojambo, who is the Executive Director and the Chief Executive Officer of the United Nations Global Compact, and we welcome her. We have Mr. Manoj P. Singh, who most recently served as the former group level chief operating officer for Deloitte, as well as a global managing director. He's currently on boards as a trustee and a board member of multiple organizations. I'll just name a few, Carnegie Mellon University, uh, as well as the Putnam Funds. And finally, we have Sir Mark Moody Stewart. Uh, Sir Mark needs no introduction. Sir Mark, you have served as the chairman of Royal Dutch Shell, Anglo-American, just to name a few of these companies. Sir Mark currently serves as the vice chair for the Global Compact Foundation. He also serves on multiple boards, Saudi Aramco, uh, to name one. Now, with this in mind, I'm sure all of our viewers around the world are eager to hear from our esteemed panelists. And uh, you know, good luck, Melissa, because this is gonna be a tough group. Uh, and I will hand it over to Melissa. And once we're done with the panel, I will come with a wrap up. So with good wishes and enjoyable viewing to all. Thank you, over to you, Melissa. Great, thank you so much, Sonny. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to moderate, which uh, what I'm sure is gonna be a really interesting and important um, session. But I thought I'd start uh, with laying the groundwork for how it is that we got here by looking at this past year. So as we approach December, the last month of the year, we can take some time to reflect and what a year it has been. In January, China, and then the rest of the world were quickly engulfed by a once in a century global viral pandemic. And then in late May, a Minnesota policeman killed George Floyd and thus began anew America's reckoning with its long history of racial discrimination. This year has certainly been deeply challenging, but it also has been a revelatory in two important ways. The first is that it revealed that we, meaning humanity, are all in this together. The COVID pandemic plainly shows that our collective fate is inextricably bound. 
our behavior as individuals helps or hurts our collective health. The virus is indifferent to boundaries of any kind, identity boundaries or geographic boundaries. Furthermore, America's racial reckoning soon became in ways a global reckoning as many other societies were forced by their own citizenry to confront their complicated histories. Black Lives Matter in a certain way has become a global phenomenon. Second, and in a related way, this year revealed that issues too often treated as separate are in fact linked. While it is true that, COVID, that the COVID virus itself is indifferent to human identities, the societies in which humans live are not. The truth is, is that humans around the world are experiencing the pandemic differently, largely because of their racial identities or their economic circumstances. So taking, for example, the US, if you are black in the US, it is likely that you are a low wage essential worker and thereby uh, more frequently exposed to contracting the virus. It is not only that, it is also that you may also have underlying diseases which complicate treatment of the virus and that those underlying diseases are themselves the result of historical discrimination and access to healthcare. So in short, the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement have amplified the complexities and the interconnectedness of these big challenges. So, so to address them, a more sy a systemic approach is needed. One that departs from business as usual and looks at long-standing, enduring problems of inequality and exclusion with new eyes. The new ways of thinking systematically using a systems approach require that we view people within the system in new ways. By that, I mean we look at them in deeper ways, more complex ways, and in more generous ways. So to explore these ideas, our panelists today will share their thoughts on how to think about, how to think and really redesign systems that can serve as practical solutions for creating change. So I'd like to go on and move to our panelists and, 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 and get, this, get our show started. So the first is uh, when thinking about redesigning, um, I think it'd be really important to think about kind of providing examples for change. So I'm gonna ask each of our panelists to outline how their personal and professional experiences have shaped their understanding of and, le and, and really the philosophy around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I'm going to start with my colleague, Ray uh, Reagans from, from MIT. So Ray, I'll leave it to you to, to give us a sense of both your personal journey as well as some of the ways in which MIT has been thinking about DEI. Thank you, Melissa. So it's snowing today. It's snowing today in Pittsburgh. And I mentioned that because it was also snowing one day in Wichita, Kansas in 1987. And a football recruiter who was looking to recruit players at a private school nearby, got stranded in a snowstorm. And he saw my high school. And he came in and he said, do you have any football players that I could look at? And so he looked that video on me and a friend of mine. And so he asked my coach, where are these guys going? I go into KU, K-State. And my friend Wayman Caldwell, he said, well, Wayman's going to junior college and Ray's joining the Marines. He said, well, they're good students. He said, they're excellent students. He said, well, maybe they would like to go to Brown. And so my story began in a snowstorm. I went to Brown, I finished, I went to the University of Chicago. While I was at the University of Chicago, I studied sociology and economics. And a friend, he is a friend, in the business school said to me, would you want to become a professor in a business school? And I said, yes. Why do I share this? The philosophy that we have in the Sloan School is about creating opportunities, is about identifying people when given the opportunity who could excel in our environment. And I have to admit that my own personal journey Bias is how I see opportunity. When people are given a chance, they can do well. So 
but I'm also a former athlete. And I'm a big believer in teams. And so it's not just Ray with you here today. It's also Dean David Schmidtline. It's my colleague, Fiona Murray. It's many colleagues who provided a foundation for what we're doing at Sloan. So if you don't mind, let me give you some background. Before COVID and the Black Lives Movement, we had a reckoning with DEI at Sloan. Our students came to our dean and said, Dave, the school can do more. If we are in fact in the world for the world, we simply do not reflect the world in which we live. And Dave heard them. And so we put together a task force. And that task force focused on ways that we can improve our community, including eventually hiring Ray and Fiona. And so we officially started in July. We unofficially started sometime in April. And how we've been focusing in our efforts. This is an awkward way of saying it. George Floyd created an incredible moment in our school. Our black students of color reached out to me and said, Ray, we don't feel the kind of community that we've come to expect at Sloan. There are black people literally protesting and dying in the streets and we haven't heard from our community. And so we asked them, we don't think your community understands how you're experiencing this. Would you like to do, would you like to share our platform? And so our BBSA students shared with the MIT community our history, their history at Sloan, and their current experiences. This was scheduled to go for an hour and a half. It literally approached two hours. It could have gone for three. And it mobilized our community in ways that it's hard for me to describe to you. I say this because in many ways, their voices have made our job easier. So that's the bigger context surrounding what I'm doing. If you don't mind, I'd like to share with you some details. Is that okay? And their details, my job, Fiona Murray is my colleague, my teammate. And we have this belief that we're smart enough to know we're smarter together. It sounds fantastic. And it's actually based on the research that people like me do on teams. We know that diversity on the team has a potential to improve team performance. But at the same time, it has the potential to fragment relationships, literally making the team less than the sum of its individual parts. And so as we hope to improve diversity, at the same time, we have to equip people with managing and dealing with their differences. And so that's where we focused our efforts initially, making people more comfortable with their differences and learning how to manage the conflict that different perspectives can often introduce. And we did that initially in orientation. I like to share this story because in my opinion, it illustrates very nicely the MIT Sloan perspective. Our folks running orientation have been preparing for orientation for over six months. New platform, COVID, not in person, online. Three weeks before it started, Ray Reagans and Fiona Mary showed up and said to them, we would like to change orientation in a significant way. And they said, how can we help? Not many people would have taken that perspective. And so we totally redesigned orientation. So orientation for our students had a big component on racial dialogue and the importance of implicit biases and shaping how we interact with each other. We started there. And then the next thing we did, our students told us, they didn't feel like their history was reflected in their core experiences, their classroom experiences. I worked with my colleagues, Fiona and I worked with my colleagues to totally revamp our core curriculum. I say them as if they were minor changes. In fact, they're dramatic changes. 
These are things that people have taken months to attempt, to try to achieve. And we were able to achieve it because our colleagues believe in the same philosophy I believe and hold. We're smarter together. And so we've changed orientation. We've changed our core curriculum. We're also making efforts on the staff side. Oftentimes, our staff lacks diversity. And the explanation is often, it's a pipeline question. And so what we've done, we've instituted, this is in reference to my Pittsburgh roots, the Rooney Rule. And so if you're looking to hire someone, you simply have to oversample on women and people of color. This doesn't mean that you can't have standards, but it means you have to go out of your way to identify talented minorities. And if you need extra resources to do that, Ray and Fiona are here to help. That it widens the pipeline. At the same time, we know there's potential for bias in how people get hired. Fiona's research is on this question. So we've added more structured interviews. We've added more diverse interview panels to increase the odds that people are being evaluated objectively. And so we're making progress on that dimension on the staff side as well. Now the faculty side is tremendously harder. And I, it's odd to say this, but in many ways, it was the economist at the University of Chicago who recognized the problem. The way students are entering PhD programs, students from more elite institutions simply have an advantage. And so we joined a consortium of schools and we've created something called the PREDOC, the PREDOC consortium, where students from across the country are given opportunities to come work with faculty members at over 70 schools currently doing research. And they basically gain experience doing research for either one, two or three years. And then they decide if they would like to move forward and become PhD students and eventually faculty members. One of my colleagues put it this way, my pre-doc becomes your PhD student, your PhD student becomes my colleague. But in addition to making these efforts and growing this pipeline, my own personal experience as a sociologist became relevant in the sense that we know that there are people who were not trained in business schools who can also succeed in business schools. And so we're creating postdoc opportunities. We're encouraging our colleagues to do what we're calling adjacent searches outside of where they currently have been looking to find people who would not only enjoy our research environment, but who would excel in that environment. I think we're making tremendous progress. I would like to tell you that it's had, that I've played a significant role. That's not really true. It's the joint effort of a team. So that's what we're doing at Sloan. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Great. Thank you so much, Ray. That was really, really um, an important uh, insight in helping us really rethink business as usual using data, observations, and changing organizational practices. Um, and it's showing us how at MIT, um, it's helping us uh, create efforts to, be, to catalyze for meaningful change in DEI. So next I'm gonna to turn to our panelists from the industry to speak to uh, your own personal leadership and career journeys and explain how these experiences have shaped your DEI worldview. And I'll begin with um, Manoj, who can tell us a bit about your own personal experiences. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, maybe just a, a few context setting uh, remarks before I talk about uh, my, my journey. Uh, I spent the bulk of my career in a professional services organization, Deloitte, and uh, as probably most of you are aware, the, uh, the supply chain, if you may, it's all about attracting and onboarding the best. Once they're there, how do you nurture and develop them? How do you create enduring high performance teams? And uh, then the last part of it is, which is very important is how do you 
perpetuate the apprenticeship model, which is essentially each individual sort of taking responsibility for developing half a dozen people like you so that they get to the same level of proficiency and, and eminence. So the, the DEI tone, in my view, is set at the top. Um, and if so, it sort of creates the difference between launching and embedding a culture versus just creating simply another program or initiative. At Deloitte, 225,000 professionals when I worked there um, and I retired about six years ago, that's how big we were, about 100 countries. The top leadership team at Deloitte consisted of 15 people, 15 individuals from 10 different parts of the world. And our view was that the enhanced cultural awareness it promoted diverse thinking. So there was a growing belief that diversity in the senior leadership team resulted in better global and local results. And that in S is the essence of a successful uh, DEI culture in my view, you know, creating better and more sustainable results. So talking about, about some of my uh, learnings, uh, Ray mentioned about how his journey started in a snowstorm. I walked in one morning, five years uh, old in the country with an MBA from uh, Carnegie Mellon and uh, having grown up in India, in, I started in Cleveland with Deloitte, a career in consulting, I knew very little about it. And, and uh, you know, as I said, you, you walk in with the feeling that you are very good and everything else will take care of itself. And I think that there are three key parameters, if you may, that I want to put in context for the learnings that I'm going to share with you. And the first one is, you know, how do you create opportunities for others that were created for you? The second thing is, how do you teach people to be comfortable about being uncomfortable? And then the third thing is, you know, how do you basically set some measurements for behavior so that you are measuring the behavior that you want to see. Okay, so those are those are the three parameters, and within that, I'll just talk about a few learnings. So recruiting, recruiting is the lifeblood of a professional services organization, and one of the things that I have always believed and I always try to do is that when you get together in a room and you're recruiting people, let's just say MBAs from Sloan School or pick your favorite school, uh, they are all very good. So it's not about picking the best. It's about having, a, it's about as important for, in this case, the Deloiters who are in the room, how do you have a conversation essentially for creating a crucible for, for, for driving change? So you talk about the individual, his and her strengths, what makes sense? You know, I always say that talent is what you have between your years and skills are what you develop over time. So, so, this is the, it's, it's a little bit about the point that Ray was making earlier, you know, giving people a chance. So you look at an individual and say, how is this individual, he or she going to blossom over time? Do you take a flyer in this person? What is the kind of support that they would need? And, and that conversation is really what I would say the start, the embryonic formation of a DEI culture, because that's where you talk about what you're all about, how you're gonna help this individual be successful, what is the safety net that you're gonna create, and how do you take risks with them? Because ultimately, you have to take risks with people and you have to be there to help them when they make mistakes. So it's about identifying talent, it's about seeing enough of them, uh, as, as Ray indicated, and then being able to visualize that not everyone is perfect and different people need different types of help, coaching, encouragement, and being able to personalize that. So it's a little bit of being small in the context of a big organization. And that's very, very important. And that's been a key part, I believe, of creating the right culture of where I was and how to be able to help people uh, grow and develop. And it's the same thing. And you, know, you cannot be attracting, for instance, African-American staff when you don't have enough African-American partners who are role models, okay? So that leads to another example, which is um, in the mid nineties in Deloitte, we started uh, an initiative called Men and Women as Colleagues. And this is more about gender diversity, but, but the same concepts apply. 
and I'll just move the clock forward to 15, 20 years after that. So, you know, we used to recruit and we still do about half of the folks coming in the entry level were women. And by the time the pipeline got to the end to promote them to partners, about, about 70, 80% of them had left the firm. And, and to fast forward and make it shorter, the, the realization was it was not about women in our firm, it was about men. It was about how men started thinking differently about how do you create opportunities for women? How do you become role models for them? Are there things that you do on a project out in a distant land where through, you know, not a deliberate process, but you're creating situations where essentially you're shutting off women from being socially involved in whatever you do at the end of a day or on a weekend or something like that. And, and so they, they are not able to build those networks that are very, very important. So that was a very important realization for us. And that same concept basically was the underpinning and the foundation for essentially creating what would be a diverse culture. And just two other quick examples. So uh, a part of my career with the firm I spent in, uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, I grew up in India, as I said, but I never worked outside, outside the United States. And this was the first opportunity. 2003 to 2008, I was in Hong Kong leading De Deloitte's Asia Pacific region. You know, uh, all countries from Pakistan in the West to Japan in the East and all the way to Australia and New Zealand. So I used to tell people there are no par threes if you're a golfer in terms of flights from one country to the other. One region, but, but very, very, very uh, diverse and very spread out. So in Southeast Asia, we had about 10 or 12 different practices. And one of my focuses was to create basically one unified practice. So, you know, the typical country, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Guam, uh, uh, Philippines, et cetera. Uh, and, 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 and so I started a process to make sure people were comfortable. And, and, and here's the punchline on it. Uh, one of the countries was very, very uncomfortable being a part of a practice that was gonna be dominated by Singaporeans. So I'm very focused on, you know, uh, results, delivery and those kinds of things. And I would go there and they would all sit in a room, they would nod their head and I would walk away and then nothing would happen. And, and you know, for me who I considered myself to be quite diverse and multicultural, one of the things I realized is a lot of people don't in certain parts of the world don't express their opinion in a big group and you have to figure out how to engage them individually. So that's a little bit about understanding diversity, about understanding culture and things like that and how do you basically uh, create, uh, create results. And then I'll end with a quick uh, uh, Hong Kong story. So one of the clients while I was in Hong Kong was the CEO of a Chinese, uh, a large Chinese state-owned enterprise, SOEs as they call them. And, and he shared with me, this, this is about Hong Kong and when Hong Kong uh, was a part of uh, was a part of Britain, and then and then and then in 1997 became a part of uh, China, one of the things that they teach you in China in the history books is that when when Britain first assumed control of Hong Kong, what the Chinese who were negotiating this probably goes back into the 19th century were told, it's okay if you give it back to the British, make sure you have a date certain when it comes back to China. And that date certain was 125 years. So the point of the story is there are some people that are in the long game and you have to understand that culture and you only understand it with diversity. So they said, it doesn't matter what you do for 125 years as long as it comes back. So again, let me just conclude by saying diversity is all about bringing awareness. It's about creating essentially in the room what you look like globally and being able to bring the best thinking to be able to continue to excel and succeed. Great. Thank you. Sandra, can you share your experiences with us? Thank you, Melissa. And really thank you to the, the two speakers before who who really addressed some of the, the fundamentals around what diversity, equity, and inclusion looks like in the workplace. You know, as I reflected on this question, I thought that if I was to base my response on what common stereotypes really are, I'd truly have to start my story off on the back foot. Um, as a relatively young, I think, Black African woman, I come from Kenya, um, I have many stereotypes that could work against me just from the start. But I have to give credit, I think, first to my parents who encouraged us to have a broad world view. And I think, fortunately, the institution is learning where I have been that have been inclusive, 
and have embraced some of the systemic change and progressive views that Ray spoke about when he shared about you know, his experience in, in, in academia. And I think just the, the imperative and support to, to push for my parents to, to explore the world and to always see ourselves as equals, very powerful positioning that anybody can give to a young person as they grow up. And I'm fully aware, as I say, being a Kenyan, that my story is certainly not the story of millions of African women who may have never had the chance to progress beyond the hurdles and challenges that keep many women relegated to the domestic sphere. But I have to say, as I've progressed as a, as a professional, I have faced numerous personal challenge. And to some extent, I feel that my, D, my diversity and inclusion experience has been a dynamic one. You know, many a time I've either been too young or I've been too old or I've been a woman, or I've been an African woman, and it's all been situational and it changes depending on context. So the first for me is that DNI is never a fixed concept. And you know, addressing it will always require firm understanding of what the contextual issues are. Um, it's also been very important and interesting for me to realize that the things that define me are also the things that either propel me forward or hold me back, depending on where I am. I think the truth is the world is living in probably some of the most unequal times of society, you know, be it north-south divides, be it income divides, be it gender divides, be it the COVID gap that you spoke about, Melissa, when you made your opening comments. But what I have found is that where I have thrived, it's because there have been strong role models. Again, where I have not thrived or where I felt discriminated against is where my ethnicity or my gender has not been valued. And that lack of value hasn't been one created by a moment. It's actually a systemic lack of value. Uh, Ray spoke about some of the institutional systemic changes that have been made around orientation and, and curriculum in schools. And it, it really took me back to my undergrad orientation, uh, you know, without naming the institution. But those are some of the moments when as a young person, you, you really look at you know, what does this mean to be a person of a different ethnicity, different orientation in a whole new world? But now moving to North America, I, I just moved to New York literally about two and a half months ago. Uh, I took on a new role in June and I started virtually, but moved to New York about two and a half months ago. And embracing myself in a society that is deeply reflecting on, on the George Floyd moment, you know, my hope is that all the responses that we've seen from business and from many other actors are the, 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 these responses will be systemic ones. This is not just a moment. It's a moment for long-term change. I think another really powerful thing that has happened in my, in my short time here has been reading a book um, that's called How to Be an Anti-Racist. And the concept behind it is that you're either racist or anti-racist and nothing in between. And I think it's something that we need to consider as we consider the discussions around diversity and inclusion. Silence on these issues is not a position. Either you're pro something or you're against it. I think the gray area is where a lot of uncertainty thrives and, and, and prospers. And I've had these sessions with our team and they've been, they've been most uh, insightful in terms of really understanding unconscious bias and reflection on what truly diversity and inclusion means. I personally am also a firm believer in the notion that you cannot become what you have not seen. So the mere act of leadership choosing to serve as a role model truly does pave the way for the next generation. I think that for leaders, it's important to educate, to empower, but also to elevate. We need to lift forward those who seek to progress. And our work at the Global Compact, where I work, really it focuses on encouraging member companies to ensure that they address key issues such as human rights and labor, because underlying these issues are gender disparities, disability disparities, and certainly broadly inclusivity as a whole. Um, I think it's really important because, you know, for me, inclusive decisions result in inclusive outcomes. And I see no reason why, you know, going back to business and, and back to the, the place where I work at the UN Global Compact, there should be no reason why businesses and indeed institutions should perpetuate uh, business decisions that certainly do not result in more inclusive outcomes for society. So I'll stop my comments there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mark, can you share with us your experiences? Yes, thank you very much. And thank all my fellow panelists for some terrific insights. I've been taking notes here. Uh, when I became 
the CEO and chairman of Shell in the late 90s. Uh, our executive committee was all male, uh, white, and British or Dutch. Now, we were a global company with operations in 130 or so countries. And I knew that during the 30 years or so of my career, which I'd spent out of my own country, living in 10 different countries, I knew we had hired able men and women of all nationalities, uh, religions, etc., all over the world. And we were an extremely diverse company, uh, one of the most diverse in the world. And I'd never worked in an office with less than seven nationalities. It was really stimulating. We thought, and I thought, that we had a good people development system and talent-driven promotion. Uh, for example, our staff reporting system, our people reporting system, was adopted in the uh, 70s and early 80s by the government of Singapore, and they haven't done too bad a job. Uh, so when you looked at the outcome of this process, which I believed in, the outcome was just statistically implausible. It's completely implausible that the, the, the best of 30 years of selection process would be male and British or Dutch, but an occasional American. So there had to be hidden blockages. So we set up a, a diversity council, natural reaction, and got people from all around the world, and most importantly, of all ages and stages in their careers. These were bright people, representative of the levels in the company they came from. And we learnt a lot from asking, what are the barriers? This thing is not working. It's statistically implausible. We hired an African-American great woman called Leslie Mays to help us. Partly because the USA had come a long way in, in my time of, of, from a student from the 60s, from being a partly segregated society to a remarkably changed society. We know more change is needed, but at that point it had come a long way. And when I was giving meeting town, in town halls all around the world, I'd explain to people the statistical implausibility and what we were trying to identify and what we were trying to do. We had some reaction, I'd say quite often, maybe half the audience uh, would react saying, yeah, look, we've always been a meritocracy and we have good systems in place. And I'd say to them, you would look at the outcome. It's, it's implausible. And we're not removing merit. We're just looking at the definition of merit. And I could see that probably about half the audience would think, ah, maybe he really gets it. So uh, Leslie suggested that uh, she organize diversity awareness workshops for the top 200 people or so. Uh, this is probably something which would be quite normal nowadays. And I said, fine. And uh, as a leader, the chief executive, of course, I was going to attend one as, as an example. Although I have to admit that, frankly, having lived in 10 countries uh, with 12 years in Islamic or partly Islamic uh, four different countries in a multiracial country like Malaysia, frankly, I thought, I didn't need it. Leslie, but I went along and I'm glad I did. Uh, Leslie got us to identify advantage groups in Shell. We had a bit of an argument about that. Dominant groups, advantage groups. Can we even talk about it? Is it possible? So after an argument, we agreed and we started and we found that there were perhaps 12 or 15 advantages. Start with men and women, which is men, obviously, in Shell. Technical versus non-technical, highly technical company. 
oil and gas production versus marketing. Uh, the money was all in the upstream. Uh, we needed the downstream, but that's where the glamour was. Uh, highly mobile people versus uh, non-mobile or less mobile. Part of our system was we moved people around the world, people of all nationalities, uh, Nigerians to Oman, uh, Omanis to Latin America, everywhere, to give people confidence that outside their own country, they really were world class. And it was a terrific uh, uh, scheme. But it was, of course, uh, barriers for particularly women or people with families or education, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, education, uh, Oxford, Cambridge, and Delft versus the others. Uh, expatriates versus nationals. Whatever nationality of an expatriate, they're normally experts. So they're generally quite often more influential or dominant. Those with supportive spouses, senior positions, need, entertaining social work and so on, and that's uh, uh, important. Native English speakers versus the rest. Scientists versus non. Dutch and English versus every other nationality, and so on. We got to about 15, and then Leslie lined us all up and said, okay, I'm going to call out the, the groups, and if you're in the advantage group, you step forward. And that's what we did. And I am in every single advantage group and landed up miles ahead of everyone else. Now, I knew that there was luck involved in getting to the top of an organization. You, you have the right jobs, you have lucky breaks, opportunities, you're places where people can see. But I had not realized how much of these small factors, some of them are small factors, some of them big factors, factors which are of value, a good education is of value, how much uh, difference it, it makes. And I learned that if you're not affected by a barrier, you tend not to see it. Uh, whatever the barrier is and from whichever side of the barrier you're on. One of Leslie's first questions to our group was, what class were you born into? Well, my response was that from my mother's knee, I'd been brought up that class was not important. It was not, it should not matter to you. It, it was unimportant and therefore we did not talk about it. And my mother was right, of course, that class should not matter. But the key to all of this is open discussion and analysis. We have to ask and listen very carefully to the answers. Ask questions in an open way and ask for information. Because as I say, if, if you're not affected by something, if you're not aware of a barrier, you've never had the problem, you don't see it. And some of the examples we've heard is making sure that people in the organization have uh, become aware of these and realize what steps they have to take to make sure that that's not blocking able uh, people. Just a, a couple more things. As, as uh, Sandra said, we need examples. So we changed the board. The board had to come from around the world uh, not to bring us contacts in that part of the world, but to make sure that we understood the thinking, that the board collectively understood the thinking. We need to aim off for uh, cultural issues. I remember once listening to a very able Malaysian who was a big friend of mine, uh, he's left Shell and became the chairman of a major Malaysian bank. And he gave a presentation to our, our full boards, big boards in Shell in those days. Uh, and it was a terrific presentation. And after the presentation, and the board was mixed, but after the presentation, they uh, 
the uh, board, several members of the board said that was great, but he is so understated. It's, you know, he's so quiet. Uh, and I said to them, the whole damn country is like that. I mean, a, a Malay in Malaysia, that's part of how you express yourself. You, you, it's, it's intrinsic as it were. And you have to, we have to acknowledge that that's a way of doing uh, business. So ask questions and listen very carefully. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. You all have given us a lot to think about. Uh, and and, and um, I actually would want to delve a bit deeper into certain of your, uh, your observations. And one is to just ask you all, how do you think about applying DEI principles to leadership development? Nearly all of you discussed in certain ways, obviously you all being leaders yourselves, you've had a lot to think about uh, uh, you, you offered already some insights about leadership, but I want to be my delve just a bit deeper into leadership uh, development, incorporating DEI principles. Who wants to take up that question? You know, uh, Melissa, maybe I'll just start off with a few uh, thoughts. Sure. Uh, just listening to my fellow panelists here, uh, I think we have to reach a stage where people believe that uh, DEI is foundational, essentially, to creating sustainable success. And so it's not another initiative. I see in a lot of companies, you know, you have enterprise risk management, which is the purview of the risk department, ethics and compliance, which is a part of HR, and you'll probably name a few different things. But places where they're successful is when it's the mainstream of leadership views that as being important in their normal discussions, decision-making and things like that. So I think that that's a key, um, a transition that has to be made in terms of, you know, just understanding why it's foundational. Senda said something I wrote down. I said, you cannot be what you have not seen. Uh, Mark said, you know, it's, uh, if you're not affected by, by barriers, you will not see it. So I think basically developing essentially around principles, creating an environment where there is much better exchange of views and understanding, not looking through just your own shoes, but what other people have gone through so that you can have a more comprehensive view of things. So those are just some thoughts. Great, Sandra? Yeah, ha happy to, to jump in here. A, a few things come to mind. Again, I think, you know, in whatever we do in leadership development, we have to ask ourselves why. You know, why do we believe in diversity and inclusion? And I think until that fundamental is answered, a lot of things will be either lip service or seeking to, to address targets or, you know, meet moments where, where businesses or entities have been called out. You know, an interesting statistic uh, we came across at the Global Compact, and I'll take this just a little bit broader, is that whereas there's a lot of focus on developing this 21st century leader and leader who's focused on issues of business sustainability, actually only about 4% of job descriptions for leaders actually carry metrics where these issues can be concretely assessed in terms of KPIs or leadership performance. So, you know, I think we also need to find ways to, to define and, and measure what this diverse and inclusive and, and, you know, sensitive leadership looks like. Because I think we run the risk of, if you're gonna measure it against targets and quotas, then you're simply ticking a box. So I don't have the answer here. I think there's a real shift that needs to happen in terms of what good uh, diverse and inclusive leadership uh, characteristics and outcomes look like. Uh, they may be much softer, but for sure they're also systemic. And I think it's very important that the leadership is, uh, you know, especially transitional leadership is, is grounded in a system, as I said, starting with asking why. Why do we believe that a diverse and inclusive workforce is important? I think that is really the fundamental. Great. Thank you. Ray? So I, I wasn't going to share this, but, but Mark said it already. One of the key moments in our leadership journey is being objective about your subjective experiences. Can you step back and appreciate the experiences that you've had and then the experiences that other people haven't had? What situational factors gave you an advantage? What situational factors gave someone else a disadvantage? That is the moment for our students. If you want to 
uh, Dean Smithline likes to say, if you come to Sloan and you leave version 2.0 of yourself, then we failed. Because this is supposed to transform who you are, not simply make you a better version of what you currently are. And so the first step is being objective about our subjective experiences. The second step is being comfortable contributing in a very elite's not the word, it's the only word I can find right now. Manoj said everyone is talented when we're interviewing them. Now imagine trying to work in that context. And we provide people with skills to be comfortable contributing in that context. But as everyone else gains the ability to share their voice, conflict. So how do we make people comfortable with managing conflict? That's the leadership arc. And here's the diversity piece. If you're a woman or a person of color, comfort contributing is simply much harder because you have a lower sense of belonging. You don't look like everyone else in the room. Conflict over ideas. If you are a woman or a person of color, the ideas that you express are more likely to be ignored or rejected. And as we take people through that part, they then start to appreciate how their beliefs shape the objective experience of women and people of color. That's the cycle. We need to appreciate how we all contribute. When Dave asked me if I would do this job, I said, yes, but if, if I can do diversity training first. I literally did a class on <laughs> diversity training because I needed to be more aware of myself and the role that I was playing. That's the journey we want our students to take. That's a leadership journey. Thank you. And it sounds as if it relates very directly to what Mark described, his own experience. And you described um, finding that you were way out ahead of everyone else, Mark. Uh, what, what was the reactions of others in the room? Meaning that exercise that you um, contributed to, I imagine that it helped them also rethink their own um, identities or at least their place in the organization? Yeah, I think I, I think I think it did, and it it helped all of us because we were able to to think, uh, you know, what of these factors are important and what are not, and almost every factor has an, a positive element in it, uh, but that positive element uh, may have an offsetting disadvantage. So you have to, to think about it and tease out the, uh, the, the, the difficulties. Uh, I, I mean, for example, one of the reasons we, we lost people, we would have terrific people, people who, who were well able to be on the executive committee and well, who I knew personally and who were well able to be potentially CEO. And very often we would lose them at a relatively late stage in their career. And we tried to address this by, by having a distributed team. My dream in the 90s was that we could have the executive committee located all around the world. Technology just didn't do it in those days. Accenture, on whose board I was, has done it and done it 10 years ago uh, so that but that's a barrier. If I had worked for an American company and towards the end of my career, I'd known that I'd have to go and work in headquarters in Dallas or wherever, I'd have quit because, or if I knew that that was what it required to get to the top, I'd have left and gone somewhere where I wouldn't have to do that. Not because I had anything against, I mean, I've, if someone had said live in the States for three or four years, fine. But to, take the end of your career and practically have to become American was just, would just have been a step too far for me because my family, my kids, everything was in Europe. If they said, go live in Holland or Frankfurt or, or Edinburgh, no problem because it's short distance. So those are the barriers and you could move people in Asia whether it's in the Philippines, Hong Kong, Asia has a, a kind of Asian feel to it. 
and senior people are happy wherever they are in Asia, but ask them to come to Europe and The Hague, you know, that, that's, that's a big decision. Uh, so we lost people. And I think now, I mean, I think Shell has done a great job since, and, and most of these companies have, have moved on significantly, which is encouraging. The last thing I'd say is that management education really is important. And one of the greatest spin-offs of the UN Global Compact are the, is the principles for management, uh, uh, responsible management education prime. And uh, uh, I think that and to have deans of schools and others thinking about what are these uh, elements, not, not just in this area, but in, in the whole uh, area of, of responsible business. I think it's it's important to have people, and people ask me sometimes, what's the most important thing that's that's not taught in business schools? I always say, you don't teach people to listen to people who disagree with them outside the company, who are shouting at them, and who may actually, you know, not have a very good point, but 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 they're not stupid, and they've thought of, They've gained this impression from somewhere, and you better find out where they're getting that impression, if it's the wrong impression. So asking questions. I believe we just have to keep asking questions and listen to the answer. Thank you. You know, in some ways, that leads right to my next question, which was to think, ask you all, what, do, what more could be happening between um, industry and academia? How can we work together to create kind of broad, uh, bold strategies um, that can help us to challenge or think differently about historical structures, systems, processes, and, and policies. Ray began by describing at least some of the changes which are demanded or at least asked by Sloan Business students regarding the inclusion of history into the curriculum and, and leading to a wholesale change. So you may start off, but I'd be curious to hear from everyone. Mark has certainly uh, hinted at the importance made it um, actually a, a plea for there being a better, uh, ch different changes in business education. So I wonder, Ray, if you could start us off. There's a tendency at MIT to believe that the knowledge begins with us and the goal is to then take that knowledge and to share it with the world. And we recognize, and what we're starting to appreciate is that's not always the case. That there are interesting ideas in the world and so part of what we do at Sloan are action learning experiences. And part of what we could do is to look for ways to partner with organizations or companies around projects in this space. I think it's one thing to say, we have to create opportunities for people and we have to support them. I think it's in something entirely different if we're running those kinds of experiments in firms to see exactly what their implications are. We know what works in some organizations. We don't know what works in other organizations. And so partnering with organizations to do the kind of research that we should do to have more confidence in what we're recommending is what I would hope we could do more of. And that's not out of a desire to do more research. That's out of a desire to have greater insight into what can we do and how can we quantify the steps that we're encouraging firms to take? So it took me a while to answer because I was trying to narrow down the request. <laughs> no worries. No. <laughs> That's something that I think we could do with firms. Right, great, thank you. That's what I had in mind. <laughs> Does anyone have any other thoughts on, on how we may uh, have greater connections between business and academia on these issues? You know, in some ways, um, Melissa, this is not uh, this. We could look at this as a bit of a beaten path in the sense that business schools have had experience, for example, with this in other areas. How do you graduate students who can grow up to be broad based, good general managers as opposed to unidimensional uh, managers, whatever that means? Uh, so my point here, and, and, and so in that regard, in my former example, 
you know, you have classes where you talk about what it takes to be a CEO and you bring in a half a dozen CEOs over the course of a semester and they come and talk in the class about their experiences and stuff like that. We ought to be thinking about some of those kinds of things when you think about a partnership between academia and business, because there is nothing better in my view that works better, that, that nothing works better than actual live examples of what people have been through and how they have dealt with it. And I think creating a platform or moments that matter where you can discuss things like this makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, it's a little bit of what Mark just said, you know, how do you, how do you engage someone who disagrees with you? Well, part of it is for a new student to understand, you know, what, how, what is the importance of networking and relationship building? as you embark on a career. Because quite frankly, if you don't focus on some of those things and you just wear a cap that says how smart you are, you're only gonna go so far. So, so, so blending those kinds of things with real life example in business, I think is very, very important. And teaching concepts to students that you wanna treat others the way you like to be treated. And what are some examples from industry where that has worked very well. So again, those are some of the things where I would essentially enhance the interplay of the partnership. Great, thank you. Sandra? I'll just add in a few ideas. And, you know, I think always reflect on education and what is the purpose of education? And then without sounding too esoteric and taking away from you know, the real fundamental traits that they are, um, uh, I believe that education really exists to make everybody a better citizen. And how you exercise that citizenship can be through being an engineer by being a doctor, by being a social worker, um, by de- being a professor in a university and, and how you take it forward. So then in that regard, one would ask, you know, do we need more education or do we need quality education? And as, as curricula continue to evolve, I think the question then remains, and I'll go back to my earlier statistic, where you know, only 4% of CEO job descriptions really look at you know, sustainable business leadership is you know, what sort of education do we then need to have that puts purpose at the center, that, put, that puts principles at the center, and then you know, surrounds that with whatever other technical skills you need to bring to bear uh, for that profession. And I know it's being done in a, in a great number of institutions. I think the issue also is perhaps do we start it too late? Um, how do you take this kind of education and start it fundamentally at kindergarten? Where I think we've all, all seen kids, you know, interact. I don't think there's any barriers and biases amongst young children. Where does that come in in the education system or where does that come in to the home and the community system? And how do we reinforce that almost childhood innocence that you see in the early stage and then keep it going all through? Because something changes in the life cycle. Um, I don't know where that point happens. I've seen it play out differently in different places, but it'll be great to be able to, to reinforce, I think, what are some of the innate values that we see. Thank you. Thank you. So keeping the curiosity alive in a way, <laughs> exactly. Uh, I'm going to end up with one big question before asking you all to offer some uh, uh, takeaways. And it is this, you all are all quite successful thinking and, and deeply thinking about these issues of d I. I wonder if there are any, who you may identify uh, organizations or leaders that you look to and think that they are uh, or trailblazers or think that they are pointing in a, in a way that uh, an important way forward. Um, who's out there besides your own efforts that you would regard as uh, uh, warranting a second look? I can't name names. There are too many. <laughs> okay. Well, that's a good. Job, that's a good point. When I took this job, Alyssa, one of the first things I did was there are a number of people taking on the same role in different universities across the country. And so, one of the first things we did was come together as a group and share with each other our own individual experiences. And this isn't exactly what you asked me. One of the first things that came up was, how are you going to sustain yourself? This is a very difficult assignment. We can all help each other do the work. But the thing we also have to focus in on is what are we going to do to sustain our own well-being while we do this work? And I have to tell you, I thank them every time I see them for reminding me of that fact. And so there are lots of people in these different roles in universities. 
I quickly call on them when I have a question. And are there others um, industries out there that are? Yeah, I could uh, I could think of uh, thinking back to my earlier days. I used to look at other companies and think, who's done a, a really good job on this? particularly internationally, because as a global company, I was looking at mixing nationalities and making sure that we had uh, proper pathways to the top. And uh, back in the 70s, I, well, 80s, uh, 80s probably, uh, I was very impressed by Citibank, who had excellent uh, local national managers, and they progressed people extremely well. So the, the country leads were very often nationals or regionals. Uh, but then I think they lost it somehow. It, it, it didn't, those people didn't come through to the top, maybe for the reasons I was talking about. The other one, which was and still is quite remarkable in, in the oil industry, is, is Schlumberger. They were, I remember at one point looking at their executive committee, I think it had five nationalities and so on. They were less good at gender. Uh, but uh, they had a big advantage because their engineers, they trained people, they recruited people and trained them in different parts of the world uh, in, in special schools they had, as it were, in different parts of the world to, to adapt engineers to their systems. Uh, and they paid them all exactly the same in dollars. But they're an unusual business because they bill their customers all in dollars. <laughs> and that's much easier if you're a marketing company or think you, you can't do that because the economy doesn't work like that. Uh, so you have the problem of, of differential scales in different countries and, and so on. It's a a, a really interesting challenge. And I, I amend, uh, commend what Manoj said about getting people in to uh, academic institutions to talk about what their challenges are in a specific subject, a specific area. It could be the area we're talking about. It could be ethics. It could be whatever. And to talk about successes and failures and give examples and challenges. Not this is how you should do it, but these are the problems I've met. And then people would be happy, I think, the right sort of people to give a talk like that and then to learn from the academic side as, did you think of trying this or did you think of trying that? So I think that the scope for cooperation is very considerable and it's it's low cost it's just time and uh, uh, business people overcoming their nervousness about academics you know we get frightened uh, <laughs> um, Melissa, just uh, uh, yeah. you know without naming specific names I would say two buckets where uh, industries and people are working pretty hard. One is professional services firms, just by the very nature of the business. It's all about people and it's a global footprint. You have to get it right uh, to be successful. And I would say for everyone, it's a journey. They're getting better at it, but it's a very much a top of mind issue. Uh, all three elements of DEI. The other thing I would say is that technology companies and by that, what I mean is that you read more and more about the challenges that they have, or either with gender or diversity, but the, but the point, my point is exactly the opposite. They're trying to crack that nut because the very fact that you have issues that they're dealing with, it means they're trying to address that. And they would like to be able to get better at that because quite frankly, that what spawns innovation, that what spawns the development. So I think if I had to roll the clock forward over the next 10 years, I think that's where you're going to see the biggest amount of change in this area. I think that's right. Um, I, you know, in, in, in one way, I, I, um, uh, I think uh, the future does really rely on, as you all are describing, finding better, more creative ways to uh, 
teach students how to uh, enter their careers with DEI in mind. And um, one of the ways that you all have all described, nearly all have talked about the importance of telling students about individual experiences, right? But stressing in certain ways, because I imagine that's an important part of leadership always to share your experiences. But in the new environment in which we are in, there's more interest in hearing about the gender and racial dimensions of a person's identity. Whereas before, in many ways, you had, there may have been some encouragement to not talk about that. Now we're in an environment where people want to, want to hear about it. So in conclusion, I have one last kind of surefire question, which is a pretty narrow one. Um, and, it's, and it's this, uh, in your opinion, what one organizational or leadership action has the biggest potential to move the needle in improving DEI policies and practices? I know there's a lot, but we just want to see if there's one, if you had to choose one, what might it be? I'm going to say, start measuring the behavior that you want to see and what is important. Um, I, I would say speaking out, speaking out about the issue. I would say keep asking questions, probe to find what it is that you're missing and haven't thought about open-ended questions and listen very carefully to the answers and, and feel your way forward to see other things that you've completely missed. You know, mine is uh, perhaps not exactly what you have in mind. I've really been struck by the new context in which we're working, where people are willing to share things about themselves that I never knew. And where I thought I didn't belong, I'm beginning to discover that I do because people have actually had similar experiences. It's just that they never shared them. And so I would encourage people to continue to share those things which they believe have made them different. And they might discover that more of us actually have those experiences in common. Thank you. You know, you've given me so much, and I think our audience so much to think about uh, in this session. And I, I hesitate to try to offer a wrap up, given all that has been said, the depth of your, of your answers and the thoughtfulness of your, of your uh, remarks make it difficult, but I'm going to, I'm going to try. And, um, and, and, and please forgive me for not capturing all that was there, but I'll, I'll say this. Um, first, you all have let us know that we have to be able to answer, go back to in certain ways, first principles. Why? Why is diversity, equity, and inclusion important? And you gave several different, def different uh, answers to that question. One is a basic concern about human capital and about getting the most out of people. Two, recognizing that unless diversity is taken into account, you may not see all that a person has to offer. So there was a, a, uh, a call for self-awareness in both a subjective way and in an objective way. And that all should be subject to it beginning at the top as Mark's uh, description uh, of experience explained down to everyone. Everyone has to be involved in that. So self-awareness, which is an interesting thing to think about at least coming from a humanities, arts, and social sciences, thinking about self-awareness in business is an, an, an interesting and important, um, obviously, observation. The other is, and connected to that, with greater awareness comes organizational change and cultural change. And every, each one of you in your own different ways said that changing an organization's culture is at the top, meaning, and, and what that means directly uh, when thinking about DEI is that those principles become part of metrics that they matter, right? And that performance in certain ways is, uh, is pegged against how DEI uh, objectives are, are accomplished. And then thirdly, um, uh, a, a big uh, uh, 
much of what you all focused on is getting to the how. How do you make that happen? So there is the why, why DEI matters, but also how it matters and how do you get there? Well, you all described the use of data in certain ways, right? Looking at data. So that data, the numbers don't necessarily speak for themselves, but you certainly need it. So these are not uh, decisions that are made, obviously, without data and and, and that these objectives can be uh, met with when data is taken seriously into account. And then finally, understanding um, barriers, uh, that barriers, uh, why people are not succeeding in your organizations in the way that you would like them to um, requires a, an honest assessment of what those barriers are. And uh, the flip side of that, of course, is once you've identified those barriers, creating opportunities and, uh, and each one of you talked about the importance of having a commitment to creating new kinds of opportunities. And if there's a narrow pipeline, finding ways to enrich that pipeline and to enlarge it uh, and, and to get to the uh, desired goal. So I hope I've done at least a, a minimally good job of describing all of the great lessons and insights that you all have uh, provided. And with that, I'm going to ask Sunny to um, to come back and to, uh, to close us out. Yes, Melissa, uh, what can I say? Uh, you know, first of all, thank you to all our wonderful panelists for an absolutely superb and terrific session. And of course, I have to thank the expert moderator for bringing us to a very natural and a logical close. Um, we shouldn't forget someone who has been behind the scenes, but is making all of this possible. Uh, and we have to thank for that uh, Zach Whitman from the MIT tech team, because Zach is smiling at us, but we just can't see him smile. Um, and, and he has made all of this possible. And it, it hasn't been easy, believe it, ladies and gentlemen, uh, but he's made it look as seamless and comfortable and smooth as possible. So thank you, Zach. Uh, yeah, the, when I look back at this session and I look forward, it gives me a lot of hope. It gives me a lot of optimism uh, to see leadership from ideas to practice. And mind you, this is the leadership, not of tomorrow, it's today's leadership talking about it. So there is hope for tomorrow. And when Ray takes us from a snowstorm to a social justice movement and lands us right into a classroom and Manoj teaches us how to be comfortable with being uncomfortable and getting the most out of people. And then Sandra tells you very clearly, silence is not an option. So Sandra, I'm going to keep talking. Silence is not an option. And, and you, you, you clearly explain why in your mind DEI is not a fixed concept. And, and, and so Mark, which, which is very interesting coming from your perspective, uh, when he talks about self-awareness, he says, keep asking questions and listen very, very carefully. Uh, so I think there is so much to take away from this. And obviously, uh, you know, where people stand on issues depends on where they sit, as the late Kofi Annan used to say. So certainly there is a lot of learning in this process and internalizing and applying to who we are, where we sit. Uh, you know, we at Accountability for the last 26 years have been focused on the area of sustainability, what we call ESG today, and DEI, of course, is a concept and a, and a, and a, and a, and a space in, in the overall sustainability arena. And we have been working through our advisory services, through our standards, very specifically in this area. Uh, and we have wonderful women and men around the world who care about this, and so do our clients. So please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions or would like to discuss this further. But most importantly, I'd like to thank all the viewers who have tuned in for this, because it's all a numbers game, ladies and gentlemen. If more of you tune in, we can come back to MIT and come back with more of these sessions for you, uh, where you can listen to them leading the way along with other global experts, bringing you their thinking, their learnings, their experiences, and their practices. Uh, and we have a lot to think about. So once again, um, you know, from all of us, all my colleagues around the world at Accountability, Thank you to MIT. Thank you to you wonderful panelists. Uh, and I, I know Zach is a nice guy. He's not going to tell me to switch it off. But I think we, we have run our course of time, Megan. So I will say 
adieu, goodbye once again, you know, a late good morning, good afternoon, and good evening uh, to all of you around the world. And thank you for tuning in and your viewership.